A o fiora tanto que tu, a te não tanto e te não apa. A camigira que tanto que tu, é novo na ite coin. A te arrogo te boca, o e mais que tu que te moriro. O nosso irá nível e te iu. Oh, sorry. O tanto o te coin a te não tanto que tu. Aí na na hina e meia te hunga com naruato te tiro a na canoí. Kurato e hari que te poca no ita wai. O era catania que tinha morreu. A e novo na ite matou te fenua. Oi no contato, contato na hora que tem na conta, tem na conta que eu não tato no contato. Morena, morena nós se viu, a vida é na hora de ir lá. I'm your member of parliament from the Mighty Maori Party. I'm pleased to be with you this morning and thanks for coming out. I just, as a way of, as we do, say welcome. If I was to have to meet you, from here, I'm from here, so that's all right. From the tribal nation of Ngati Rangiwe. Um, and I'm um, pleased to be with you this morning and thank you to Anita and, and whoever was responsible for getting me here to talk. Uh, I've got, I know I've got about an hour and a half and I know you guys all want to get back to work. Um, but hopefully this is work. It'll hope, hopefully help uh, to inform the mahi that you're doing. Uh, a little bit of background. I, I come from here. I'm from, uh, I stay at uh, Longinui Street in Waititi. That's that way. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, Longinui Street is named after my grandmother. Uh, Leonard Road is after my grandmother, her name was Nanginui Leonard, uh, and uh, we stay on our Papakaina land. So I have roots here, the flavel side is from up north, uh, and I came home when I was about five, lost my dad when I was very young, and stayed with my mum and she burdened me off to boarding school, not because I was disruptive anyway or anything, uh, but simply because she thought that St Stephen's was going to be a good place for me to go to education. And then from education went into teacher training, I got my degree, got a master's in uh, Māori and Anthropology, and basically spent much of my career in education uh, as either a teacher, a whole, uh, an excellent teacher, uh, a high level teacher, uh, as also uh, uh, in the secondary level uh, to principal of a school, St Stephen's School. If you go over Bombay and look down on the left hand side on the left, there's a place that looks like a prison, it was. Um, I went to school there for five years and went off to varsity, the teacher training um, and um, as I say, principal, I went into the secondary, sec uh, the, the tertiary sector as well as uh, chief of executive of Te, te Whare Wānunga when we are in Whakatāne and also came home here um, after one year only uh, to back, back to politic and made myself redundant um, after one year at Wairiki. And since then I went into consultancy and then from there the foreshore and seabed issue came along for the Māori Party, the beginnings of the Māori Party. I uh, put my hand up and said, oh yeah, I'll have a go at that, never believing that I'd go into parliament because Politics isn't, wasn't my bend. Uh, I love I love the engagement with students uh, and, and 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 teaching, uh, and so I decided. Uh, oh well, uh, I got in, um, which was pretty good. So I've been there for ten years, and in the last year and a half, I've become a minister, minister for Māori development, which is basically everything, uh, as well as Fine Water, as well as associate economic development minister. Uh, so uh, it's pretty good. Uh, pretty good when you have good days. It's lousy when you have ugly days. Uh, but generally, it's pretty good when you have the ability to influence people's life. So that's a quick background about where I come from and all that sort of stuff. I still stay on the proper kind of land out at home there and spend probably about uh, four days away from home. Have done for the last ten years and try and get home and be as, at home as much as possible. Um, but uh, she's pretty full on. Um, and uh, in the end, I've got five children. All of them are all speakers of Māori language from when they were born. They speak English as well, thank goodness. Um, it's pretty helpful now and again. Um, and they all speak as, and my wife is a speaker of Māori as well, so our whole family is a Māori language speaking environment. And the eldest is a doctor, as a physical doctor, and the youngest is just starting off in a uh, career in health sciences in Otago. The other ones are in film and, uh, and teaching. Anyway, enough about me because it's all about you. So the question is, I want to make sure um, that I'm on the right, I'm on the right wavelength. So if you came here thinking that I was going to tell you about something, can you just let me know what that something was? I'll make sure I give you that something in case I divert off. So uh, anybody quickly able to give me an idea, very quickly, short space and time, about what you expect to get from me, so I can try to, to give it to you and I. Chuck half those slides out that I've got there. Uh, we'll do what I have to do. So, anybody game enough to put your hand up and just tell me quickly what you expect to get from me today? Um, 
Cool. That's a good. That's a very good help. Thank you. I got that. That's sort of covered off. Okay, we'll try on that one. Yeah. Keep going. Any more? So we're talking about the treaty, can I just make that clear? Oh, okay, good, that's all right. Oh, that's okay. So we are going to talk about the treaty, so you want a little bit of history, a bit of background and stuff like that, and then sort of practical implication for now. Okay? Yep, what else? Any more? Is that good enough? Shall I go? Oh. Cool, got that one, that's good. I'll try and get to that. Yep. Okay, so I've got an hour and a half to cover all that. <laughs> so, so I won't cover all that. What I'll do is I'll go, because I think I've got most of it, and uh, wrap it up at the end. So what I intend to do is sort of co generally cover the treaty, but a historical context, bring it all the way through. Uh, down to sort of current day. Uh, I won't talk specifically about that or stuff. Uh, I'll just sort of make it general and at the end we'll do a big sweep up. So I'll try and whiz through these slides. I'm happy to leave the slides for you if you want to have a look at them later on as hard copies and I'll give them to Ani to just to hand out if you want them. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't, didn't uh, prepare because I wasn't too sure that's why I wanted to check if we're on the right space or not. I think I am, uh, but at the end we'll do a, a, a wrap up. Can I just acknowledge all of the councillors that are here? Thanks, thanks for coming along. Good to see you all um, and uh, appreciate you being here. All right, hopefully this technology is going to happen. Sorry? Oh, that way. <laughs> Alright, so I think generally, alright, so this is what I reckon that I thought I was going to talk about, reflect on a little bit of history, which is what you talked about, reflect on Anzac Day, because that's got a little bit to do with it as well, talk about politics, hell I'm a politician, I've got to talk about politics, which is still the Treaty of Waitangi at its essence, uh, talk about Maoris, that's sort of got something to do with it, the Treaty of Waitangi and race relations, because inevitably you start talking about the treaty, you talk about race relations, inevitably. Somehow it comes to the past. So that's a sort of quick overview that I thought I was going to talk to you about, which is basically wraps up to where you sort of are at. It's important that we do reflect back, and some of you have said, let's have a little bit of history about this stuff, uh, because we need to. The events, the events, sorry, the events of today are sort of coloured by what happened in the past. Um, and I suppose I was thinking about yesterday, uh, that yesterday on television after Anzac Day, there was a sort of a television programme on Māori television, you might have seen it which talked about, and even the day before, actually on Sunday, uh, was about Māori reflecting what they, uh, around Anzac and what it meant to be going overseas and what some of those soldiers might have thought about when they were going over and what they thought about when they came home. And there seemed to be a disconnect about how they felt about for God, for King and for country, getting overseas, fighting the good fight. I mean, we're talking about 18-year-olds, for goodness sake, 19-year-olds getting on a boat, help. I mean, it's scary for people heading down to Wellington on a plane. Just imagine heading on a boat with a rifle in the hand, a pack, heading overseas, going to fight for God, for king of the country. Why did they go? Oh, because I'd be done and I told them to get on that plane, or get on that, uh, that boat, and head off to somewhere they'd never ever heard about, seeing, or whatever, they're heading off to a battle. I mean, holy cow, what was going on in their minds? And when they came home, and some people even reflect about how we deal with veteran, uh, those people who are been to Afghanistan, to Vietnam, and so on, how it felt when they come home and didn't live up to what they actually went over to do. I mean, that was some of the reflections. So our people got the call up, uh, and uh, they answered the call, they went overseas, the Māori Battalion, those stories are well known. Well, they came home, and I think that they sort of felt that they were a little bit let down, uh, and that they needed to rebuild themselves. I know that because one of the slogans that we had in the Māori, in the Māori Party was to pick up on the slogan of the uh, New Zealand Māori Battalion when Sir James Henry came home and they were welcomed down in Wellington, somewhere in Wellington, uh, the Māori Battalion was welcomed home and Sir James Henry said, E wama, e hoki ki au putu kaima, e ngari ki au mai, tonu ki te kōrero, tu Māori mai, tu Māori mai, tu Māori mai. To my comrades, go home, go back to your marae, to your mountains, to your rivers, to your lakes. Go back to their people. But remember, above all, stand as Māori, stand as Māori, stand as Māori. So you think back, what does that what battle mean? Of course they knew they were Māori, they're all soldiers, they're all the Māori battalion. 
there must have been some quarter on there about being proud of their achievements, about being strong when they went home, to never forget that legacy of those people they left behind. I suppose promises of things to come, because that's what many of them felt they might have been contributing to. So I just offer that up. E hoki ki obu te kind of thing. And of course, that then drops down to the whole discussion around the flag, because I know me, and my marae, a couple of years ago with, uh, with my pocket here, I tried to say, to them, put the tinoranga te the tama flag up me. I said, no way, no way. So on all of our tarawa marae, you'll know that they, they hang the, uh, the uh, New Zealand flag, the old one, the new one, uh, the New Zealand flag, and they also hang a flag that has the ensign on it, as well as the marae name. So there's a very strong connection from Māori about that, uh, firstly, the legacy of the, of the Māori battalion and fights and battles overseas, but also to the flag, on the basis of that quarter of that statement, watch, which was for God, for King and for country. That's important because we know that when Hāne Manahi was sort of celebrated in some sense, that discussion was huge on the quarter of the Māori because we know that one of the, um, the, the sword hangs somewhere and the altar cloth represent something else, and the photo of the Queen, all of that part is that same legacy. So they had some dreams and aspirations, and in that documentary, there was, I think there was a question mark as well, did it really all pan out to how they felt about it? But they had some dreams and aspirations as well, which is basically my all of it. Anyway, quickly, this is gonna be fast, because I'm assuming many of you will be aware of some of this stuff anyway. So just to set the background, once upon a time, there was some Maoris, um, <laughs> and they lived, in Hawaii, they ended up coming over here very quickly. Uh, so they came here to Aotearoa. And throughout the world, there are others, discoverers and settlers doing the same thing. Everybody was traveling around the world way back in the day. And uh, our people, Māori people at that time, who were the only people on this land, they had various systems in place. All of those there, they had their own systems in place. So for them, some of you in the room, how do we know that Māori had an education system? Waiata? Yes? That story's been handed on. They had Whareiwana, yeah? So we know that we had an education system. How do we know that? Well, Tapua Noa, we know that must have existed. So that was a system of law around land, land tenure. All those sorts of systems were in place. We had an economic base because the land provided that economic base. And we also had all these systems in place as well. We had our language was in place. The health system, of course, happened in our way. Not everybody survived with a shot on the arm, but we all got by. Uh, there was a system of justice as well. So all those systems were in place, and there was a collective responsibility to everybody in the camp. We all worked together. And throughout the world, other people, as you know from your history lessons, if you went to Nōmata Prom, you fellas know this, um, <laughs> we had all those people travelling around the world. Uh, Michelle, those are all names that we all remember from our history days. They're all going around throughout the world, and so on and so forth. And there were rules around acquiring new lands, eh? And those rules were, there are no rules. Um, uh, when you went to another new land to claim over it, you know, you did it by certain ways. Uh, and um, so, basically, it was a sort of uh, survival of the, the fittest or whoever was able to overtake other people. That was it. So, there were no regulations for acquiring territories already under a jurisdiction of a recognised uh, sovereign. So, how would, we stake, how, how would people stake their sovereignty over uh, other places, well these are some of them. So you, you'd either do it by arms, by force, or you'd go on and say, I now am an authority over this land, or sign treaties, or anything else of those things up there. And fine, those are sorts of ways that are recognised as being how people claimed sovereignty back in the day. And so, <coughs> that was driven on the sense of Akinoa <coughs> Mother England, we needed to get some more resources, uh, serve things at home, there's new markets, trade, etc. All these were reasons why people went around the world to basically colonise other places. I'm moving quickly because I'm just taking you quickly through all this stuff. And in the end, there was an element of a desire to have power over other nations. There was a common view at the time, right, that coloured people were savages, cannibals, needed to be civilised under Almighty God. Black equating to evil, savage, and we still have that, even as we talk about now, and white equates to pure, Allah, wedding gown, etc., etc. And so, it's civilised children of God. So, what we do know in history is that lessons learnt in one place were also transferred to another place. So, as you can see, 
things like the suppression of rebellion act in 1797 in England was transferred here to Aotearoa, an act exactly the same as it was over in, uh, in England. A key player in the world affairs at the time, as you'll know, there are two key players in the world, and they're still pretty uh, important now, although one is probably more important than the other, Mr. Te Pope, uh, the Pope. Very important at that time in the historical context. And so, in quick history, uh, and you can look this stuff up on the internet, because I did it last night, just to make sure I got all my facts right, the anti-satirical papal bull is like saying papal bull, why would you, what's a bull? You know, we all know what a bull is. It's another way of saying a bill or a piece of legislation or a law or regulation. So uh, this is what basically sanctioned this, the colonization of the world from the Pope. And it's still in place, uh, as, you, as I say, on Google, check it out. Uh, you'll find it uh, in there. Gives you a little bit more uh, background to it. And of course, with the Pope, you're acting on behalf of God or in his or her name, whichever way you want to go. <coughs> so what does it look like? It looks something like this. We therefore see to you the right to, to see this whole, your holy and laudable work, to subdue and take the mainlands and islands and the infidel, infidel natives, especially Tauroa, in all places discovered, oh, sorry, and discovered or to be discovered from the Arctic to the Antarctic throughout the world in the name of Almighty God. So that was the edict that allowed people to go out and do what they had to do. Now when you look on Google, it's a hell of a lot longer than this. Um, I, I, I got this from Warner Jackson, uh, so I know that it's there, it's implied in the wording, and I checked it out uh, last night. But like I say, check it out in Google. So, uh, and I also checked it out because I, I found it in this book called Slavery and the Catholic Church. You might want to have a look at that, and it sort of says the same thing in a sense. Free and full permission to invade, search, out, capture, subjugate, etc. I'm not going to go on with about that, but that just gives you the, gist, the general gist. Oh, sorry, for reference there, comes out of teachings concerning the moral legitimacy, legitimacy of the institution of slavery, and that's the gentleman, uh, Mr. Maxwell, as a reference for you. <clears throat> in a short space of time, 37 years, another declaration was issued, and it was called the, uh, by the Church of England, uh, and it was called the Requiremento, which shortened the means requirement. You are required to make the statement when you go to move towards a new place, uh, and uh, you read it out, of course, when you arrive. And again, that sanctions and supports the whole notion of taking of lands, as well as the authority of indigenous peoples and so on, because that's where you're generally going to go and, uh, and colonize. All done again in the name of God. <coughs> so the requirement, requirement I says, uh, this, king and queen have the right to your lands and you are required to submit and acknowledge. Remember, you're reading it out, with anybody listening or not, doesn't too much matter. If you maliciously delay in doing so, we shall take your wives and children and take away your goods and shall do to you all the harm and damage that we can. Your lands are donated to us in the name of Almighty God. So that's a requirement. Did it happen in Aotearoa? Well, uh, Wakefield, of course, is associated with New Zealand in our history. The Wakefield Company was responsible for the New Zealand Company. And this is what he had to say in 1842. Well, those, those natives in particular, Aotearoa, uh, may not appear as savage as the Australian Aboriginal, he is nevertheless still lost in primitive darkness. They live in wild and uncivilized anarchy and have no form of government, etc., etc. You get the general gist. Yep. Uh, the last part, of course, is in a way that is ordained by God. So, now we move into the history. So that paints the context about how people are going to build colonization. Then what happened, well, six, just to pull us all in line and remember those things that we were taught at primary school. Abel Tasman comes along, Captain Cook comes along, explorers come in, they go up to the north generally, they're into whaling, sealing, etc. And the Dereo people could see that there's some benefits to be gained by an association with the settlers. Uh, and possibly the reverse, we don't know. Uh, then followed by the wave of missionaries. And there's a quick overview about how it all happened. Uh, 1769 through to the 1800s, so we're talking early 1800s, various churches arrive, uh, and so on and so forth, Catholics come in, um, etc, etc. So 1830, 1838 we're talking about. Uh, now we're starting to get down to a little bit more detail. 1831, some, some chiefs gather up north, and they, they think that, holy cow, there's some soldier, so when you're at sea for six to eight months, and you see land, and you arrive in port, there's probably two things that you want. I'm just saying. <laughs> One of them is alcohol, and the other thing, I'm sure you know what we're talking about. I want to chase some woman if you're a sailor. And so what happens is, of course, at that time, 
because there's a hell of a lot of unlawlessness in the north. That's historically based. Why? Because you mix alcohol, and it's no different today. You mix alcohol, there's all sorts of problems go on. So there's an element of unlawlessness, and for all intents and purposes, while the Māoris are taking theirs, care of theirs, bargain, uh, their own way, we have some, salt, some uh, uh, sailors arriving into the port, there's no law, nobody's in place, there's no jurisdiction, etc. It's open slaughter. So that's how it sort of all happened in the beginning. Um, so some are starting to think about, hey, we've got to start getting um, a little bit more order to this. We want to have a relationship with those who are arriving here because they have some things to, that we can learn from. Uh, but this whole issue about um, behaviour is a real serious problem. So <clears throat> there was never, of course, any, any discussions around handing anything to England. Why? Because you're in the, in the numerical uh, um, um, majority. Uh, but the discussion happens. And the chiefs at the time are clear that they want to have an element of autonomy to continue to do the things that they've done since time immemorial, since settling on their own. 1833, the first British, British resident arrives in New Zealand, uh, but that person is basically governed from Australia. Uh, they have a role, I suppose, in seeing us to have a little bit of money, but most reports talk about British residents having not too much money at all, uh, certainly by the way of the settlers' point of view. So we have, in 1835, what's generally accepted as being a signing of the Declaration of Independence. In uh, 1837, then we have the New Zealand Company arriving. That's the sort of general timeline. So the 1835 one is quite important, um, simply because it sets the scene, and we'll get to that shortly. But also the issue about a flag has been raised uh, a couple of times, so I thought I'd just chuck that up. Before the Declaration of Independence, a flag has been adopted, and flags are important at this time because you have to have a flag on your walker, um, or else you're regarded as a pirate. So you've got to have a flag, and this was the flag that was set up at that point in time without British government, if you like, uh, being involved too much. So discussions are held around the company, to, around, sorry, around the country, sorry, let's go back to it, uh, to advance a couple of things. Number one is to make sure, uh, when I say hui, that we're talking about Māori having hui, uh, getting together and talking about how to maintain that notion of rangati the tongue, the ability to make decisions about themselves, how to deal with the settlers who are a little bit lawless, and the, the question is other companies are coming in into New Zealand, the French and so on, uh, the Dutch have had a look, so they all have a look here, um, and um, so they've got a bit of a worry about other countries coming in and having a look. And so Māori is starting to travel overseas to Britain, England, and Wuli Hita, that's a name associated with a lot of our history, he said he heads over to Britain, um, and they are watching about what goes on and what happens in other countries. Um, many of our people don't know that. that our, our people were travellers. They were trading over to Australia at the time. So a lot of travel going on, albeit slow, but nevertheless it's happening. People are travelling around the world. So what did Aotearoa look like in 1835? It's generally accepted that there was about 90 to 250,000 Māori. Now I know that's a big, huge chunk of a difference between 90 and 250,000. Come what may, we know that around 2,000 settlers were here. Whichever way you look at it, overwhelmingly, in 1835, Māori are in control of this country. That, of that, there is no doubt, just straight numerical. Uh, and this number of settlers, of course, is relatively low, and probably in pockets, probably in pockets. And in that year, we have the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It happens on the October the 28th, 1835, not known. Not too many of us would know about that sort of document when we were at school. Uh, but it's a precursor, of course, to the Treaty of Waco. So, <coughs> those are the things that contributed to the, the Declaration of the Song of, of the Declaration of Independence, the threat of, uh, uh, of the French arriving, uh, the notions of dealing with lawlessness, and of course, uh, the whole issue about flag and trade. I'll move on. Okay, so this is, I'm not going to go over all this really quickly, but you'll see the, the, big, uh, the big statements are, the hereditary chiefs and heads of tribes declare independence. That's a huge statement. Because you're saying we are a standalone country by ourselves, we are it, we are in charge. Um, an independent state under the United Tribes of New Zealand. Second clause talks about all sovereignty, power, and authority within the territories of the tribes is, is declared to reside entirely and exclusively in the hereditary chiefs and heads of tribes in their collective capacity. That's a pretty huge statement, uh, and it's probably factual, bearing in mind that there's overwhelming Māori presence, They're in, the, the chiefs are in charge. That's a, a clear statement. We're in charge, and we have sovereign uh, authority and power 
over all things that are going to happen here. Uh, and more importantly, if you just look down the bottom, unless by persons appointed by them or and acting under the authority of laws regularly enacted by them. So in other words, they're saying that if they can delegate, in other words, saying they can delegate the authority to others, which is pretty innovative at the time. Clause 3 talks about agree to meet in Congress, which is probably important, and they recognise that there's, there are some, some tribes down the south. Because uh, <laughs> they agreed to let them come in and have a listen as well. Uh, so that's important. And then the last one is... Um, acknowledge the flag. As I say, the flag is important simply because um, that's the whole notion about how trade can can happen. Right, so I'm sorry to go so fast now, as long as you get the general just about where that's sort of heading, eh? Hey? Okay, boy? Alright, so that's important because all these people were English witnesses to what happened. So you've got to think about, well, that's all very well. These tribes get together, they have a declaration of independence. What the hell is happening in England? Well, I've got some representatives here who signed that to be a clear statement as did James Busby, the British resident. So there's a clear recognition from the British resident, from those associated at least who had some authority, uh, to the fact that Māori was signing a Declaration of Independence, acknowledging they, we, were in charge of the country at that time, without anybody else being around, I suppose. So there's an acknowledgement. Five years on, we get to the treaty. So, I want you, now this is your job, just to have a break in the discussions. Here's some questions for you. If you can, within the groups of about four or five, or just around you, uh, and I know if you if you haven't got a piece of paper right on your hand, um, <laughs> just to uh, discuss these questions, eh? for about, no more than about three or four minutes, here they are. So the first question is, when Britain went to countries like Aotearoa, don't answer it now, in your groups, just discuss it very quickly. When they went to, uh, like, sorry, when Britain went to countries like Aotearoa prior to 1840, was it normal for them to negotiate a treaty prior to colonising the country? Why? Why not? Number one. Number two, what is a treaty? Uh, number three, uh, did both treaty partners recognise each other as sovereign nations? Yes? No? How do we know? Any questions? Cool. Well, organise yourselves, line up in a bunch or whatever, and give me some answers in five minutes, no longer. I detect a, a, a lull in the discussion. Uh, these fellas said that they're the brainy side, so I'll just check. So just uh, rather than point us out, just to get a gauge, when Britain went to countries like Aotearoa prior to 1840, was it normal for them to negotiate a treaty prior to colonising a country? All those who said yes, put your hands up. Was it normal to go negotiate treaties? If you said yes, put your hand up. Nobody said, oh, okay, okay. The next question is why? So I'll take a wild shot at the back. Somebody from the back tell us why it was not normal to negotiate uh, treaties. In the middle of there somewhere, whoever's, who's the spokesperson? negotiate treaties if you want the land just move in and take it is that fair right so that's fine uh, so the next question is next question is what are treaties what are treaties anybody so we'll start at the back on the far corner what are treaties that's a fair quarter right that's good anybody else want to add to that Uh, so the question is, it's about equal. Do they have to be equal? I suppose it becomes the, what's the definition of equal, eh? Uh, so, but it's, uh, the, the point is made over here about nations, okay? About nations, which leads on to our third one. Treaties are an agreement, yeah, uh, uh, stitching together of nations. Uh, so that's, that's an important point to be made. 
uh, does the treaty, uh, sorry, did both treaty partners recognize each other as sovereign nations? All right, so here I am. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm England, we're England, New Zealand, Māori's over there. So do we view them as sovereign nation, as a sovereign nation? Hold on, hold on, just to check. If you believe that we do, England, believe they are a sovereign nation, put your hand up. Two people. Well, like from according to that, they must have, because James Busby was their resident, and, and he signed it. Okay, so we're not too right, we're not sure. Okay, so you Māoris, you Māoris over here, you're looking over to England. Uh, are they a sovereign nation? How do you know? <coughs> hold, hold, just help me out. How do we know that they're a sovereign nation? Because you all said yes, so what? How do we know? That's this side, Māori's dead. But how do we know that that lot over there is a sovereign nation? Because they've got a king and queen, and they have a flag. That's right. So they've got a king and queen, they've got a flag. So let's just back check over here. Hold on. Have they over there got a king and a queen? No. No, chiefs here. Yeah, okay, but we'll let the chiefs aside. We can deal with them. Uh, but I've got a flag. So they've got a flag, which implies an independent nation. Which therefore means that yes, all right, they both knew at the end of the day that they were sovereign nations because of the flag notion. Remember, it was five, six years before the signing of the treaty, and of course on the back of, of Busby, etc., etc. Right. So that's a quick uh, overview of that. Right. And more importantly, this is a guy that, that came around the corner uh, prior to the signing of the treaty, and he's, when they're getting ready for the signing of the treaty, he says, "We're going to have a treaty with a people whose to title to the soil." and to the sovereignty of New Zealand is indisputable and has been solemnly recognised by the British government, which sort of ties together, yeah? Sort of ties together with the flag. All right, three more questions for you. Oh, and we acknowledge New Zealand as a sovereign and independent state. All right, so here's three more questions. What are treaties about? Did the British know what treaties were? How do we know? Did Māori know what treaties were? How do we know? Oops. Those are the questions. Three minutes. Let's go. All right, all right. All right, let's have a look. Let's have a look. I'm taking the cue from the back row that said they know all the answers. And they were sus there. All right, so let's leave uh, the first question for short space and time because the other ones hopefully will be, be a little bit easier. Did the British know what treaties were? Back row. And Any other comment to that? It's pretty good, eh? Nothing else there? matters I can't answer that. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not, I haven't got that background, all of that background, but I appreciate you adding into the portal. If just staying with it, they generally agreed that British knew what treaties were about. Why? Because they were doing them, had done them in the past. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The next question is, did Māori know what treaties were? Uh, so I'll start on, 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 on, on the sort of, uh, I'll just, well, sort of over, over here, just on the dead road, just about somewhere there. <laughs>
So everybody get that comment? So generally there's a view that yes, they did know what treaties were about because uh, crossing areas of land, they had to negotiate, etc, etc, moving the battles and so on and so forth. Yes, they did. So anybody, everybody comfortable with that? So Māori know that treaties are what the, uh, that the, about treaties. British know about treaties. Everybody knows about treaties. So what are treaties about? <laughs> That's the last part. So. Okay, when everybody wants to try and wrap it up and say, enough. Okay, that's one way. But what are they about? Coming to an agreement. If I can give you one lesson about treaties, they're about rights and obligations. Rights and obligations. So in the minds, and we'll get to it shortly because it's the, at the heart of the discussion of the treaty. I give you the right to do this, but here are the obligations. Everybody get that in a general sense? You can have the right to come here, but here are the obligations. Generally, those are the key words in terms of talking about what treaties are all about. Rights and obligations. Right, let's move on. So, I just want to chuck all these ones up because this is quite important and I'll speak through it again and I apologise for that. But it's to try and tell us, actually, when we're talking about the treaty, it happened real quick. So we're talking August. 1839, when Hobson leaves London, leaves England, Great Britain, he's headed over here, looking to secure sovereignty over New Zealand in a legal manner. August to December, he arrives in Sydney. January, he arrives in the Bay of Islands. January 31st into February, he's starting to meet with non Māori. Colenso was an important player in there. He sets up some invitations. So, what that's telling us is it was done relatively quickly in that context. And then on the day, as we're moving towards the day, February 3rd, Hobson draws up the uh, draft star of the treaty in English. He's assisted by his secretary in Busby. The text is finalised three days in advance. The Māori then translated by Reverend Henry Williams and his son. People start gathering on the 4th, two days in advance. On the 5th, Hobson opens it up, discussions happen, and the 6th, it's all done and dusted. So August to February, from the time of him leaving Great Britain to arriving here, is pretty quick. So i just go back from December. We're talking December, he's arriving in Australia, and in January, he arrives here and straight into it. So, He's trying to get a good job description. <laughs> Drop the appraisal. So the clunk, I put that slide up just to say, you know, uh, that's that's pretty quick. Hey, there's something going on. Is that we'll talk about that right now. <laughs> so what we what we do know is that there are more than two treaty documents in the country. We also know that there's two versions. One in English and one in Māori. There are 512 signatures, but only 39 are on the English version. The rest are on the Māori version. So what happens, we'll get to the question, so just come with me, just go around and talk straight away. <coughs> What happens when you've got two texts that are clearly at odds and, are different and interpreted differently? And the international law, this is, this is known pretty much in anybody doing treaty discussions, there's a clause called the contra preferentum clause, which basically means that anything, that's what there is, uh, that a provision should be interpreted against the party who drafts it and that the indigenous language text takes precedence. Under international law. So we've got two versions. Most of the Maori, most of the signatures are on the Maori version. But we've got a problem. Clearly we all know there's a problem because that's at the heart of the discussion around the treaty and those rights and obligations I talked about. But under international law, the indigenous version is said to take precedent. So what does the indigenous language uh, the version say? 
Firstly, it says, <coughs> give up to the Queen of England forever all of the governorship. Now, put it in the context of looking after those lawless settlers. To govern, give to England the right to govern your own. Why? Because Clause 2 says, the Queen of England agrees and consents to give the chiefs full chieftainship of their lands, their villages, their possessions, honour. And there's an issue there about the, the right to sell land and so on and so forth at agreed prices and to agreed purchases. But the key here is, and this is where we get to the, the issues about interpretation, is that under the Māori version, agrees to consent the Māori's have full chieftainship of their land, their villages and their possessions. That's the second uh, clause. The third one says that the Queen will protect all the Māori people of New Zealand and give them all of the same rights as those of the people of England. The fourth one says <coughs> a recognition, if you like, of Māori custom and that that will be protected into the future. So those are basically the four, four clauses that, that make up the Māori version. So what are the differences? The English version says, the English version we're talking about here says, we have sovereignty over New Zealand, England, we have sovereignty over New Zealand, we have full and undisturbed, uh, they have, sorry, they have full and undisturbed possession of the lands, forests, and other properties. They can be agreed land sales. They get royal protection as, and having rights and privileges of British subjects. And that's it. And that's what you gave to them when you negotiate. So the Māori side say, right, they have Kawanatanga governorship over their people, the ability to, to look after themselves, because we're in the majority, 200 something, 90 something thousand, 2000. We have Tino Rangatira Tanga, absolute authority over our lands, etc. Absolute authority. We get royal protection, which is awesome. We have the rights and privileges of British citizens. And finally, we have religious freedom. So what are the key things in there? First one, of course, is the issue about whether you have kawanatanga or sovereignty. Did Māori cede sovereignty? That's the issue. And from the historical background, the answer is no. Well, that's the debate. That's the debate. They Māori say we had absolute authority, it was guaranteed under the Treaty of Waitangi. There's a bit of a problem because there's a few glitches in terms of the translations. So, as you can see, Kawanatanga versus sovereignty. British say, we've got sovereignty, they've got undisturbed possession. So, what does that mean? Versus absolute authority. So, I've got a flag, <coughs> we've got a flag, we own the flag, but we'll give uh, Monty over there. He can rent it, he has possession of it. He can have possession, that's all right, because we have our ownership. Everybody get that? There's the difference. And then of course the issues of subject and citizens. Some people would argue, well, citizens is, we're equal. Subjects is, king and queen and all the rest. You get what I mean? So those are the sort of some of the discussion that's come up around the debate of the wording. Right? So there's the difference. So, there is a difference of interpretation which stays right with us to now. But both parties, in a sense, believe that they got it right. What they discussed, which is possibly why that Māori version was signed up to by the vast majority. Because they believed that Māori version was the one that they were agreed to. Just as much as the settlers believed the one that they signed up to was the one for them. So, 
if that's all the background, is, has there ever been any sort of challenge to that? What's the, who's the arbiter about who's right? Well, apparently, in order to solve those things, you go to the international court. There's a downside, is you can only go to the international court if you recognise each other as sovereign nations. So, does Māori, Māori represent a sovereign nation in New Zealand? Māori say yes, but the government will probably say no, we're all New Zealanders. Therefore, they will never get to the international court. And there have been attempts to go to the international court to test the issue about the versions of the treaty. Um, <clears throat> and of course, then there's the whole issue of, of Māori attempting to raise these issues on umpteen occasions throughout our history. But they've fallen on deaf ears. There's clearly some um, knowledge gaps throughout the whole country, which is what, why it's quite neat to have you all here. Hopefully this is going to give you a little bit of information into the future if you didn't already have it. Um, and the race card gets played quite regularly, and particularly at a sort of a political level, uh, that there's too much of those Māori's getting too much, or that sort of stuff. Um, and I suppose there's a need to have a little bit of understanding from all New Zealanders about this common background that we have with respect to the treaty. And, and, and I say that in the sense that I know we only got an hour and a half of witness, and we ain't going to cover the whole lot. Uh, mine is just to give you a sort of an overview, and you're going to have to do some more homework on your own. Um, <clears throat> and the downside, of course, is that in the government giving up, and I'm in the government, government giving up something is giving away power. And that's always the biggest, the biggest issue about the ability for someone to give something about power and control. So, how did the balance of power change from Māori being absolutely in the majority, getting to the treaty, what happened after that? Well, of course, <coughs> the population tipped over, got some balance to it, the settler population increased, and we got to a point where we're not in the majority. Hello, there's a bit more uh, intermarriage, more arrival here, more migration into New Zealand. There was another way of going into uh, New Zealand and to Māori societies by way of what some people might talk about as being the attack of the soul, which is basically the use of missionaries in the church. The removal of an economic base, which is basically stuff we're trying to deal with now in terms of, uh, of settlements, treaty settlements, and so on. <clears throat> and of course, the imposition of a new law, a, new, a different type of law, which came from that balance of power. So, how did it change? Well, clearly the education system had something to do with it. And la last week or so, there was a, a bill that we managed to get through Parliament about uh, Te Pere Reo Māori, the Māori language bill, which basically provides some money to the Māori language in the country. Whereas back in the day, that some schools I know in education, at some school, the policy was, if you taught Māori in any school, you would not get any state funding. That was policy. Right? So that's the sort of stuff that happened in the education system. Um, and it was very much around religious education, industrial training, and, 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 and instruction in, in English language. And that, in fact, since Stephen's school was pretty much built on that, that whole uh, scenario. So that's an education. And one who, who's been a sort of a key in some of this stuff always talks about colonisation is achieved by military might, change of system of law, and political power. So in, in the military sense, it didn't happen in Aotearoa because we're the other side of the world. I mean, to have a if we tried that whole notion of Britain coming in here and taking over the country, it ain't going to happen because it's such a huge task to bring all that infrastructure over here to take over the natives. It ain't going to happen. So the treaty was seen to be an easy way of doing that without having to get into the whole war system. Uh, so it didn't necessarily happen here. Although there were wars, naturally there were wars. Now, um, this one is what's called the confiscation line. And... Hold on. One of those lines, I'm trying to remember, it's either, it's either general shoots, traces, there's a line there, and that's the, oh, damn, I can't read it. One of those lines is what's called the confiscation line. So in other words, when, uh, when some in Taranaki uh, went into war to protect their space, the law, the law basically took over, and I'll take that one for example, because that's big enough as it is, this is the smallest one. From there, so all we're talking about is basically North Taranaki, follow that line all the way through this Taranaki, Mount, Mount Taranaki, then you put it somewhere over here, all the way down to there, and all the way, that's almost down to, what is, Maru, that's almost Wanganui. 
that was called the confiscation line. So with a, a pen, basically just legislated that all of that land on the west is confiscated. That's what people talk about, confiscation. So if you go to two Hoi people, they can show you the confiscation line because it's now a road. Government said there, to there, it's now confiscated. So that's what we're dealing with in terms of treaty settlements. And as you can see, there's just some figures up there that tell us um, how land was acquired, either through the courts, uh, the land court, or through confiscation of illegal purchases, etc. And government confiscated land, 1.2 million acre, uh, acres, etc. So that's the system of law. Then in the political sense, there's those sorts of things that have happened. The Treaty of Waitangi, the Constitution, and then Māori Representation Act, and I, I want to deal with sort of quickly now to bring us through to where we're at at the moment. So the Constitution Act, remember this is, what, this is 12 years after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. So there's a need for a government, we need to have some government because balance of numbers is starting to settle up. We need to organise a parliament. At the moment, everything's run from Australia. So in order to set up a parliament, you need a system to vote. So how do you vote? Well, you've got to be over 21 years of age. Secondly, you've got to be male. Thirdly, you've got to have individual land title. So yes, there are Māori over 21. Yes, there's some males around. But no, the land title is collective land ownership. Therefore, Māori disenfranchised from being involved in the establishment of the political process. Be that as it may, Parliament set up. Now, over time, of course, our Māori start to build up in numbers and become pretty important in terms of the balance of power. And so, and when that happens, a new law is introduced by that Parliament that will set up one of those rules. And that piece of the legislation is called the uh, Māori Representation Act. Now, hold on, this 1852, coming quickly through to about what, 15 years after, to the Māori Representation Act. Now, but the Māori Representation Act was set up and it created four sets, as the bullet point tells you, in the House of Representatives. It's a way of dealing with, there's a break, outbreak of war in the King, King Itami area, the King Country, um, and they had acres and acres that was confiscated. Uh, it's a way of bringing Māori into the political view, because they feel as if they are in, in the part of Parliament, therefore are peas in that sense. Um, and of course, it, it, it sets up the whole uh, political infrastructure because it means that Māori are in there, but we have four seats and a parliament, for, and I'm not too sure what it might have been at that time, but it's 120 now, and therefore you'd suspect that it's any, anywhere four and amongst 70 is bad enough, if you get what I mean. Uh, so this is one way of dealing with it, Māori giving two, uh, possibility of holding the balance of power, let's change the rules, let's just have four seats, and that's how it was up until when I grew up, not there were some times the 15 seats out of 72, that's what we could have been entitled to um, according to the criteria, uh, but we get four. So I grew up pretty much, on, you know, as I look around, pretty much most of us, I think, would have grown up at a point, if you knew it or not, I think it was up to about 1985 that it tipped over that we changed to MMP, and what came with MMP was an increase of seats, uh, albeit the seven. Uh, so, anyway. There are other bits and pieces about how Māori can and cannot vote. Um, the definition of half caste was given to enrol uh, Māori seats and so on, but I'm not going to go into too much. Just suffice to say uh, that the rules as we come through Parliament have, have been changed and adapted uh, according to the time. Sometimes, in a sense, one might say is to suppress uh, uh, Māori political representation in the Parliament of our land. European seats were reviewed every five years because of population changes. Um, Blah, blah, blah. In 1967, Māori candidates legally entitled to stand for general seats. So for some of us, that's not, not long ago. So, that's what's happened in the political sense. But what have Māori been doing against all that background? Right, so I'm not going to delve a lot on this, but it was just to set out there have been attempts in every sort of shape you can talk about, whether it be absolute warfare, through to setting up our own similar structure, the King Movement, the King Itama, through to uh, having documents like covenants, New Zealand Wars we talked about, there's been passive resistance, the Fiti Ogomomaito Kakai over in Taranaki, there's been hekoi, there's been the rise of, of 
political movements, there's been the rise of prophetic movements, as in having a prophet, people like the Koti. There has, the Pariyaka is talking about the passive resistance movement. There's been delegations overseas, there's been petitions. And again, the duplication of systems that people have seen, in other words, parliament, Māori parliament. There has been a Māori parliament in this country. We have alliances, Tridek, the Ratana movement associated with the Labour Party, uh, where the Prophet Ratana uh, meant to move a formal agreement with the Labour, the Labour Party, trying to get amongst that sort of political um, um, apparel. Been absolute protests, the, the Raglan Golf Course, uh, groups like Ngā Tamatoa, land, land marches, been some changes in, in uh, fortunately enough, some parties have been able to change the legislation. So, bastion point, flash point. Springbok tour, all of these sorts of things. And then we start to move into a positive line of Māori setting up our own things like the Kohangareo, Māori Radio. Hiko <coughs> uh, again, protests, Waitangi's ongoing. Uh, and in Taupo Tūrangi, we had um, Hui Ko by the late Sir Hepi Te Heu here about consolidating, bringing everybody together. It was an active campaign to say, actually, some of those people who uh, marched over uh, and have not a very good track record in, in New Zealand history should not be celebrated by way of their street names. How about we celebrate some Māori names? And that campaign has actually just came to the fore probably two or three weeks ago in New Plymouth, uh, where a, sub, uh, a de developer named some streets or didn't engage with Māori around that place, and Waitara is very much at the heart of the land wars in Taranaki, didn't engage them with them at all, but just put his uncle and auntie's name on the streets or whatever, it just caused a bit of a furore. Um, Waitara Gardens, some of you might remember this, Roto Field, uh, there was a take up of celebrating the 28th of October, it's been an important day, and the two boy issues that have come up over the years, fiscal envelope, which is around the amount of money set aside for settlements, there's been hikoi, and then of course the mighty Māori party came around. So we'd sort of say that we were a part of that ongoing history of trying to have a political space in, the, in this land. Um, so that's that. And finally, just to sort of wrap up what's happened is that even though we've got the two versions of the uh, English version and the Māori version of the treaty, uh, because no one wants to deal with it, we go then to the next stage of reinterpreting what that might mean and call it the principles of the Treaty of Waitang, that's the new beast, uh, 1989. I don't, I cannot remember if much has been done about that, but it talks about uh, consultation, blah, 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 and I'm sure you may able to find some stuff in there. The key message, I suppose, in all this is that whenever something comes to the concept, Māori always, in life, trying to find justice, look to the Treaty of Waitang as being the place that they can go to, we can go to, to find some sort of element of arguing about justice. I talked to, the, to you the notion around rights and obligations because that's what it has seen about the treaty relations with that treaty rights and obligations. And what we've tended to do is try and look at it in the context of, right, there were some things that went wrong. We know that because there are volumes and volumes of history that are sitting in the Waitangi Tribunal that tells us things didn't necessarily go how they went, how they were supposed to. And that successive governments, National Labour, have both attempted to deal with that by, by firstly either getting that evidence in the Waitangi Tribunal or just putting their hands up and saying, yeah, it happened, yeah. Let's negotiate, let's do some settlements. So that's how it's done. And for all intents and purposes, a lot of that has been set up. On one side, Māori say, hell, settlements, 2% of the real value of what we will be owed, but most have gone there. Most have gone there. 2% of the real value that's owed against confiscations. So if you had a look at that map and understood that you don't talk about easily in Taranaki about issues in the biggest sense about race relations issues in Taranaki because that land was confiscated under law from Taranaki Māori. And we are coming back to revisit that right now as settlements roll through. So there's a sort of a sore point and I just wanted to sort of raise this, if I can, just um, one point before I go to the slide, I'll just go back a bit. So, so uh, last year there was uh, a move towards commemorating uh, um, battle sites that happened about a year or a hundred years ago, 150. Uh, and uh, 
and they, they happen. So just to give you an idea of where these places are, when you go to Rangiriri, most of you are going to Auckland, go through Rangiriri, when you drive through Rangiriri, you are driving smack dead through the middle of a battle site that was Rangiriri. Smack through the middle of it. The motorway goes right through it. And just where the pub is, or used to be the pub, it might be a restaurant now, just there are, there are soldiers buried with Māori in that cemetery that are on the back of that battle. When you go to Oraco, through the back road to um, Kehikehi, you go straight through the Oraco battle site. When you go to Tauranga and on Cameron Road, there's a place called Pukahina in the there's two, there's two sites going across there. One is called Gate Pa. Now, when you go to Gate Pa, it's a paddock. Now there's some big po there, because last year they commemorated that battle that took place there. So uh, it's a cliff. And somebody had to negotiate that. But that again is right on the road. You can see it when you go the back road to Tauranga. And then on Cameron Road, we get to Tauranga and you're heading down Cameron Road. On the right, probably many of you, I might be speaking just about myself. Until about two years ago, I'd never have known that there was a that that, that you drive smack through the middle of a pass like called Pukahine, where they have a I think it's a church now or a, a museum now that is situated there right now. You can tell it's there. Because at the commemorations last year, there are now six or eight poem that sit on the roadway commemorate what happened there. So these things are around us. And actually, when you're in Tauranga, and a part of this, the commemorations I went to was there's a cemetery as you sort of you had it, an all that motorway mush down by the waterfront, and you go over the bridge to the mountain from town. On the right hand side, you see a big cluster of Pohuta cover trees. In there, are soldiers that are buried who are, would have been 18 years old, plus uh, Māori who were at those battles, buried smack dead in the middle of Toto. And the past side is still there. So that history is around us, and a constant reminder of our combined, combined history. But what now, uh, and even now, uh, sorry, I'm just going to this, we know that those issues that I've talked about the treaty have still some relevance today. So we talk about Māori Wards Hill. It happened in this town around the whole discussion about why is it or is it not appropriate that Māori have a say somewhere in the negotiations around firstly local bodies and then the bigger picture. The Kermanese, many of you probably won't know about this one, but there's a, the government determined about three months ago that the Kermanese Trench will now be a sanctuary. And everybody went, yay, that's awesome. New Zealand, whoa, we're up there. Until the United Nations, we've set up this big, huge sanctuary. Awesome. This one problem, that in a negotiation about 15 to 20 years ago, the government said Māori had the right to fish there. But for the, Australia's, the legislation involved here says that right is now gone. That's why we're in heavy negotiations with one Nick Smith to say, hey, hey, good idea, but actually you should have spoken to the Māoris first, because you couldn't negotiate it, as opposed to go to the High Court and find yourself up against it because you have just negotiated away, taken away that right. Whether Māori fished in there is of no consequence whatsoever. You have a right. So that's still right here and now. Trans-Pacific Partnership. So most people would say, hey, that's a pretty good deal. We're getting free trade in here. You can do business overseas. Now, the question is, well, what about the treaty right? Prime Minister and others say, hey, it's all right. It's all good. It's protected. And the next question is, well, if it's... If something comes into conflict, who decides whether it's protected or not? And the answer is the government. <laughs> so the government is adjudicating over an issue where they might be in conflict with Māori, which is the tension. So that's the Trans-Pacific. The foreshore and seabed, well, I think most of you around would remember that issue where the government of the day said, oh, Māori now have the right to go to court to test ownership of the foreshore and seabed. I now take away that right, and I claim all of the foreshore and seabed for New Zealand. Hold, hold on, hold on, Ellen Clark. Māori have a right to go to our court that you've set up and how we operate to test ownership. You've just taken away that right, and that was the issue about the foreshore and seabed. So these issues are current. They're not way back in the, you know, never, never days. They're around us as we speak all of the time. So. I'm quickly running to the end of my time. So that's the sort of background today. And the last part I wanted to leave you with, because this is important, 
I suppose is, and this is general knowledge, just so you see how the political environment plays into this, this is, this is an extra, extra $5 on my account at the end of the day. <laughs> if you know, I'll just test. If you know the number of members of parliament there are in your parliament, well, no, actually, I'll come back a little bit. Uh, just to gauge, just to gauge. Zero is, don't mean nothing. Ten is it's absolutely important. I want you to rank for me the importance of politics in your life and your work. Rank the importance of politics in your life and in your work. Zero meaning, nah, don't cut it. I can't, couldn't give a stuff. Three, two, very important, hugely important. It's something that I think about day and night and dream about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll count from zero. I want you to put your hand up and leave it up. When I get to the number, that's you. Zero is not. Ten is dreaming. All right. Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Couple. Good. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Oh, I love you, fellas. <laughs> all right. So generally, we all accept from five up. Hey, it's pretty important. Okay, it's, it's, yeah, it's important in our lives, it's etc. Right up there, some people all in about the seven or eight. All right, so that tells us that politics is quite important to all of us. Well, let's test that. So the first question is, if you know the number of members of parliament right now, in your parliament, that you feel important about, put your hand up. Don't talk to anyone. Don't ask the question. Don't say, I think it is. No, no, you either know the answer or you don't. And a show of hands, if you know the number of members of parliament in your parliament right now, put your hand up. I have one, I have two, I've got three, I've got four. All right, okay. So the rest of you are now out of the question. So <laughs> if you just keep quiet and talk amongst yourselves. For those four, if any of those four people know the majority that you'd need, the number of seats that you need to be the government, put your hand up. One, two, three. Oh, good, same four. That was helpful. And that's important. Okay, so what's the answer? 61 is correct. 61 and 121 is the answer. All right? So there's 121 members of parliament. Usually 120. Usually 120. You need 61 to be the government of the day. This is a quick exercise. So of those 121, there are 70 electorates. 70 electorates, uh, of which Rotorua is one. And of those 70 electorates, there are seven Māori. And why are there seven Māori? Because Māori have an opportunity to enroll in the Māori role or the general role. At the moment, about 50% of Māori is on the Māori role. The other 50% obviously on the general role. Right, and the other way to get to Parliament is by having what's called a list seat. And there's usually 50 of those, so I'll go with those. And how are those allocated out? Well, after the election, you get two votes, right? One for the party vote, and one for the candidate, people like me. So when you put your party vote out, uh, those seats are allocated according to the percentage of the vote. So, 1% um, of the vote equals about one MP. This is very loose. But generally about 1% equals one MP. Any questions on that? So 5% of the vote, you get 5%. Five MPs. But there's two catches. First one is called uh, the five percent threshold. Mm -hmm. So you must get your party. You must get five five percent to uh, to be in parliament without any um, any sitting candidate. Mm -hmm. So the Greens are the best example. The Greens they, they put people into electorates, but they seldom win any seats. But they get there always because they get over five percent of the party vote. At the moment, I think they're sitting at about 14%, 14%, so they get 40 MPs, something like that. If you don't get to 5%, 4.9, 4.8, sorry about it, go home and have a boy. Right? That's what happened to Winston probably about two elections ago. He got to 4.8, sorry about it, go home, have a rest. So that's one. And the reason that I get to be where I am is because I won my seat, so that's me, I won Wairiki, and we got we got 2% of the vote or thereabouts. So I'm, I'm one, I need to get to two. 
This is an easy way to explain it, and I get mad at my fox as well. That's why there's two of us. Right? So if you, if you get under 5%, as long as you win the seat, you can still be in Parliament and drag other people in according to the party vote or the percentage of the vote. Everybody get it? Alright, the last part then is, so what does Parliament look like now? So here's the next question. Oh, so I'll just check with you first. If you believe that National is the government, put your hand up please. It's not a trick question by the way. If you think, oh, thank goodness, no, that's good, that's a good one. So we've got uh, just over half of you believe that National is the government. So the next question is, of that 61 or higher, if you can tell me the number of seats that National has, put your hand up. Da -da 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 -da. If you know, put your hand up now. If you know the number of seats that National's got. Nobody. Oh, one How many? 61 is wrong. Anybody else? 57. Oh, no, if I was guessing now. No. So I'll keep you in bed. No, I'll tell you. 59. So under MMP, under MMP, the, the, uh, the thing is, is that you cannot govern yourself. One, one, there was, there's no, in history, no time ever when one party has governed by themselves. So the Prime Minister knows that. I think Labour knows that as well. So you're going to make some mates. So, Prime Minister goes to act. He gets one, still short. And he goes to United Future. Gets one, 61, boom. And just to be fair, I'll go the other side as well. So Labour, oh, I think it's 34. Labour's 34, NZ first is, well, Green's actually, sorry, the Green's. Green is, four, is, is it 12, uh, 14, I think. Yeah, and New Zealand first is 12. No, can't be. What's that? That's 60, no, no, it must be 32. Then. Oh, where are we? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so that's 58, right? 58. And the market party is 2. So, uh, that's the political scenario. So even if we were to join late, we're still not 61, therefore can't go. So what's, what's this all about? What do we do in Parliament? And this is relevant to the treaty stuff. It's actually every day we always talk about treaty because it is about that whole relationship issue. So, two things that you've got to know about government is, the first thing that you do is you pass the budget, which is coming up in about a couple of weeks time. If you cannot pass the budget, you cannot run the country. Why? Because the budget says we pay out for local government, uh, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Social Welfare, blah, blah, blah. If you cannot pay them, you can't run the country. Make sense? So how do you pass the budget? 61. Got to get 61. And that's guaranteed because it's locked up, but there's a problem. And uh, if there's a by-election, one of the MP stuffs up and has to go to a by-election, and if by chance National or the other two lose a seat, they're not 61, but 60, it's all over. Got to go to a by-election. One election. Everybody understand that? So the Prime Minister says, oh, um, we've got a bit of a problem. I'm sitting on the cuffs, so 61, oh, tough. And if I lose a seat, hmm. But dicey, you might be able to run the country, but have an election. Where can I find some stunningly good looking, highly intelligent <laughs> people from Rotorua, Tarawa, Sin? Ah, ah, Mori Kaisi. So he comes and talks to us and says, uh, says, uh, what's your No, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> he says, uh, uh, we'd like to have a relationship with you. Uh, okay, what you got? <laughs> so he says, uh, I, want to, I want you to wait for the budget. Well, let's keep talking. He says, I need you for the budget because then we've got stable government. There's no, not going to be any question whatsoever in three years. is going to be, things are going to be a bit dicey. We say, okay, what, what else? He says, well, we sit down. Yeah, that might be okay, but we want to, we want to get out clause. So we call it an agree to disagree. And that means that we can vote against them whenever we want to. So, and, and in that sense, they've already got their numbers to pass any piece of legislation. So one thing you do is pass the budget that happens in about another month or so's time. Other than that, we're bringing in laws or amendments to laws. And who brings them in? The 
Kau tunggu kita ni. Tim, when, what? So, so we agree to disagree. We can vote with them or against them. He says that's fine. We've got some other mates, but he also says just make sure to tell us. He says, oh yeah, that's cool. So we'll call it a no surprises clause. <laughs> they want to know. And we say yeah, that's cool. And he says if you know he's finished now, look what we've got a few dreams and aspirations. So we want some policy gains, which is how we get final water. And how we get to lift uh, the age of children going to get their uh, uh, getting medicine and so on and so forth, um, warming up of houses, getting into the housing stuff. So my uh, party, the beneficiaries, that sounds stuff. Those other bums to claim it, um, and we want some dollars. That's by negotiation through the budget. And the last part is we get to be a minister. And he says, yeah. So what are you going to do? Oh, the Minister of Māori Development and this and that and the other thing. He said, cool. So deal, done. That's what we said. So that's our agreement. And the last one I wrap up is, here's the anomaly. That there are seven seats. This is for those of you who are Māori and Māori well. There are seven seats. And six of them were with Labour. And one with me. And then I'm the Minister. And I get to call all the shots because I'm with the Government. And six can't do a thing. There's one thing about the political environment is that if you're on the opposition, you get nothing. If you're on the government of the day, you get everything. The whole legislative program, the budget, the whole bit. You cannot do too much when you're in opposition. So, spin it all the way back to the treaty. Is that we consider our, our job is to protect that treaty. Because it is still alive and it's still relevant and no one's told any, us any different. It does provide the rights and obligations for Māori in this country, and we will defend that for the mates. Does that mean we're anti-Pākehā? No. Seems we are, it means that we are pro our people and trying to pull our people and address some of the issues with respect to the education issues, the welfare issues, the housing issues, the deprivation issues. We have to call it, because I see it on a day-to-day -day basis as I travel this country. I've been last week in the South Island. I've seen, I've seen uh, in the Bay of Plenty, I've seen houses where at the kitchen, where you wash everything, you can look directly to the floor and the hole in the wall and the hole in the floor. People live like that because they, they cannot pull themselves out of issues of deprivation through no fault of their own. We're talking about elderly people as well. Now that's, my, that's the ones I see. There are umpteen others. I've been in Christchurch last week where I saw uh, the corporate end of Mauritan. I also went outside the, uh, the uh, church group that had a lineup of about six or eight at three o'clock in the afternoon, with three cans in their hands and a guitar having a party. I've seen them all. But one thing that I see in terms of talking about the treaty is that while we're only two in this party, we add to the picture because we bring one dynamic that no one else can bring. Independent. And this is not a political speech, it's just to try and place it into that. In terms of us addressing issues of the treaty, then it does come down to the willingness and ability of those major political parties to have that discussion. And it's too tough because elections are about winning the power of the country. That's why people pour so much money into it. Because you're talking about being in three years of not being able to influence anything whatsoever versus three years of being able to make active change. That's the difference. And so we're there to protect that space and, uh, and that's how it all rolls. Yeah. And with that, I'm just about there. We started uh, just before one Monty ch chucks me up. Um, we started with the notion of saying, What are you here for? And I hope that I sort of answered most of it in uh, one way or another. Probably some that are hanging. A few questions is about, Well, what do you take that into the future? I think that even here at home, uh, I think there's with a sense of pride that I, I go around the country and talk about what we as a community have done to involve Taoma in decision making. But that all comes down to relationships. That's what it's at, at the heart of it, is relationships. And I, I, I had my own preconceptions about how I dealt with ministers in the national government, because I wasn't a minister before, 
But actually, when you sit down with people and you talk about these issues on a nice, easy level and form relationships, then a hell of a lot can make a change. A hell of a lot is only for the better. I mean, I've sat with ministers and I thought, man, they're the uh, hardest things. I could use other words. Uh, but in the end, actually, you know, when you sit down and talk to them uh, and you're equal mana, I never see myself as the junior minister. I'm here representing Māori Dam. That's what they put me here for. I'm the minister for Māori development. I got my eye over. I have to see if somebody gets murdered in Kawaro, I need to know about it. Why? Because I'm the minister for Māori development. If somebody hasn't got a house, Māori. Why? Because I'm the minister for development. If you're minister for education, just worry about education. That's all you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about everything around you. So it's an important position, but it's hugely important, not only because of the legacy of the position, but actually because that's where you get to talk to the ministers and say, hey, you know, we've got different ways of doing things. We operate differently. And in Rotorua, I think we're hugely lucky because, um, you know, in our communities that we all generally get along fine together until we get something that's raised up into, the, into another level and all of a sudden we find ourselves bang, bang, bang. In fact, if we just sat down and talked, talked things through and had the court and people felt comfortable with how we do things, then I think that will change a hell of a lot. In fact, you know, in Dallin we've got the most number of Marae probably in the country. And I keep saying, gee, we should, when, when it's still a shock to me that people in our town come to our tangi and are just blown away by what they see, what they feel, uh, not only in their hearts, uh, but around them about the monarchy that people are shown when they come to Tangi and how we just we just do our thing from a Māori perspective but everybody gets, whoa, is this what it's all about? Why? Because we don't engage enough. So if there's a plea, that's probably it, but I sort of kind of like to think that I'm talking to the converted. Why? Because you're here. <laughs> if I was here, you came to the seminar, you didn't have to be, and you came to listen to the quarter, hopefully for two reasons. Why? You either wanted to confirm some of the things in your own mind or you wanted something new and, and the mere, mere fact that people come for something new and come with a listening ear is hugely important. So thank, thank you for giving me some time. If there's any quick questions you've got before Monty gives me the book, uh, then let's have them. I think the, the first part is let's just recognise in the first instance that there is a partnership and we need to talk about that. Then policies will flow after it. Because if you continually arguing over is that relationship there, then we're always going to be at that space. It's just bang, bang, bang. Um, so um, probably that's another seminar in its whole, in, in, in itself, is just to sit down and have that quarter about how you can flesh it out. Perhaps that uh, our, our people on the council at the moment is some of the stuff that they might be well considering um, as a part of the discussions in the future. Any last quarter? And then I'll let you go. now for everybody to pass on. Actually, just in case somebody asks,
Um, well, it's in the eye of the, of the beholder. Uh, the suggestion is no, not enough. Uh, in fact, uh, the big campaign at the moment is to try and, in fact, the Minister of Education has rejected it outright, that there will not be sort of uh, historical um, teaching of New Zealand history to this, to this depth in schools, if I can put it that way. So she's sort of rejected that. Um, so that, that's the downside. But they say because schools are supposed to be self-managing, then every school has an opportunity to teach it, which then implies, well, if you want it taught, then parents have to go and ask the school to actually teach it. That's, that's the general rule. Um, at all in, in the history, history curriculum, but the downside is, of course, that relies on the teaching fraternity coming to the party as well. Uh, so probably not too much, uh, or not, well, it depends. If you think that there's more to be given there, then, then so be it. Uh, can I just say, though, that if, if you, I just wanted to check, just check on this one. Uh, if, if you believe that you could vote for the Māori Party at the next election, this is not about favouritism, I just want to check if you believe that you can vote for... No, I'll just tell you, never mind. It's a... <laughs> uh, when I go to audiences, many of them don't actually know that they can vote, or their party vote, for the Māori Party, because it's seen as the Māoris. Yeah? You can vote for any party. You can vote for the Bill and Bean, Bring Back Buck, uh, the... the more dope on the street party, any, anyone you want to talk about, on your party vote, you can vote for any party you like. Yeah, many people don't know that. Uh, so, yeah, anyone. You can, anyone can vote on your party vote, not for the candidate though. I just, I just passed that on and clearly some of you didn't know that. So now you know, you can give your party vote to any vote, to any party you like, heck, or anybody. But brainy ones know where to go. <laughs> anyway, thank you for having me, really enjoyed uh, uh, helping you out and hopefully um, it's been food for thought and uh, please pass it on and happy to help out again in the future uh, with any other seminars uh, home is where the heart is and so I'm always pleased to help out where I can thank you so much for being here have a good day and uh, kia ora tātou